Yeah. So my name is Tian Yuan. Uh, I'm an assistant professor working at Mount St. Vincent University in the Department of Business and Tourism. I I am a new immigrant. I joined, uh, I came to Canada in 2013 um, at the age of 35. Uh, after four years job seeking effort, I finally made it to the mount. <laughs> yeah, so mount uh, is actually my first perma permanent job here in Canada. This is the last lecture of a six six, six week series lectures about China. Uh, how many of you have uh, attended the previous ones? Okay, thank you. So we have talked about Chinese food, uh, the delicious cuisines. We talk about Chinese history, uh, international trade with, uh, with, with the world. And we talk about um, uh, the women's role uh, in the Chinese society, and also uh, Chinese astrology all things enjoyable. Uh, but today, uh, I might uh, have brought something not so enjoyable, uh, because I'm going to talk about uh, um, a problem or a phenomenon in the Canadian society. Uh, you know, Chinese students is the largest international group, student group in the world. And it's also reported that Chinese students have experienced the biggest difficulties transitioning from school to work. Um, and also, you have witnessed a large Chinese community in Canada. Uh, Chinese community, community uh, Chinese immigrants is the second largest uh, immigrant group. Uh, only second to Indian, uh, slightly smaller, the population is slightly smaller than Indian immigrants in Canada. However, you also see that Chinese um, professionals or Chinese people are uh, heavily underrepresented in the top management, uh, top management positions in Canadian workplace. Also underrepresented in the political arena in the Canadian society. Uh, so why is that so? Uh, so today, I, I'm going to talk about the cultural challenges faced by Chinese professionals in the Canadian society. Uh, so this, this is uh, mainly based on a research done by me a few years ago. Uh, the research question is, what are the major cultural differences that fundamentally hinder Chinese young professionals' <coughs> cross-cultural adaptation in their early workplace experiences in Canada. And how? Uh, I want to dig deeper into this problem. What specific cultural differences are the major problem? Um, and this paper uh, has won the Honorable Mention Award in uh, uh, ASAC which is a national conference in the area of organizational and management research in Canada. Uh, but today, I also want to talk about something more. Uh, so based <coughs> on this research, uh, I want to relate uh, related to my own experience as a professional working in Canada for a few years now. Uh, so what about the culture challenges in our Workplace, workplace experiences uh, later on. Uh, so what follows? Uh, is there a dynamic process, uh, meaning different stages of adaptation, different types of cultural challenges? So I want to talk about that as well. Okay. Um, so talking about culture, uh, what do you think culture is? Culture is a very large concept, uh, quite a vague concept. And this is a very popular cultural model. Uh, it is, it's called the iceberg model. Uh, so the above, above part is the visible part, uh, but it's only uh, a very small portion of the whole, whole issue. So this visible part is called objective culture by academics, uh, including things like um, the linguistic system, which is language. Uh, the economic 
and the political system of a society. The, uh, the pop culture, uh, arts, uh, like literature, history, um, and music, uh, dance, drama, sports. So uh, also uh, something, anything you learn, you can see from books. Uh, so all this visible part is called objective culture. But it deeper in culture is, is something called subjective culture. It's in our mind, in our mindset. It's the invisible part. It, uh, it's, it's about our values, our assumptions, basic assumptions, and philosophies. So these are not so visible, but it's considered more uh, fundamental, determining your uh, behaviors and cross-cultural interactions. So in academia, people think this subjective or invisible part uh, is the fundamental cultural challenges uh, encountered by people. Uh, so what are these subjective cultural values? Comparing Canada and, and China, uh, the most uh, prominent three cultural value differences are power distance, uh, individualism versus collectivism, low context versus high context. So I, I, I would like to, um, to look into these three, three aspects to see are they the fundamental challenges? Uh, so what is lower power distance, you know? Canada is considered as having a lower power distance, which means uh, people are relatively equal. Uh, the social hierarchy are uh, not so rigid, uh, and people are relatively, relatively so it, it's defined as the inequality uh, dis distributed across different uh, classes across the society. So in Canada, we considered uh, the inequality is relatively low, so it has a low power distance. But in China, it's, tr it's traditionally known as having a high power distance, where the social hierarchy is very rigid, and uh, there is a higher, uh, higher degree of inequality between different social classes. Uh, individualism versus collectivism, I think everyone is quite familiar with, with that. The low context versus high context, it's about a nonverbal uh, behavior, your uh, communication style. Uh, it's considered Canadian people are relatively straightforward. Um, they, they mean what they say. Uh, so if, if they are not so happy, they will express it. Uh, but Chinese culture is considered as high context, which means people don't uh, people don't express their anger or their negative emotions so directly. Uh, they will, they maybe give you some hint, some clue, and you you need to relate it to the con to the context. You really need to relate to the context to think what what does this person really mean? Because Chinese people are so indirect. <laughs> well, there's. So there's so much thing, uh, so much thing to to guess. <laughs> so this is considered a high context culture, uh, the Chinese culture, very typical high context culture. So these are the three major differences in terms of subjective cultural values um, between Canada and China. So I want to do this research on some uh, young professionals. This is the this is my sample. So I conducted. Uh, my interviews, uh, each interview is at least one hour, it's quite in-depth, uh, and my interviewees are all ch uh, are nine Chinese young professionals. They were all my former ch uh, students in China. Before I came to Canada, I taught in China for 10 years as a university professor. So these students were all my former uh, students in that university, and they came to Canada through a two plus two program, um, which is a joint program uh, between the Chinese university and the Canadian university. 
and they have all gradu graduated from the Canadian University between 2012 and 2015 with a Bachelor of Commerce degree. And then they have all obtained uh, at least one year of full-time work experience in a financial institution, mostly uh, banks or some mutual funds, um, uh, some insurance companies, etc. Um, so they are really excellent students, and they s spoke quite fluent English. Before they came to Canada, they already obtained an IELTS score of at least a six. The, 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 the maximum uh, score of IELTS examination is nine. So before, even before they came to Canada, they already had a, at, at least a six or seven or eight score uh, of IELTS. So they spoke quite good English. They are so uh, hard working uh, to, to find a job in Canada. They want to stay in Canada. They are, they are excellent, excellent young, young professionals. They are confident. Um, but why? But, but what, what culture challenges are they still facing? What are the problems they have experienced in their uh, workplace? Uh, so this is my uh, question. Um, so here is a summary of what I found about the uh, <coughs> subjective culture difference. So the first, um, the first dimension, uh, low versus high power distance, which means the Canadian culture has a, a prominently uh, less hierarchy and more equality. This is actually the most prominent culture difference uh, I found in my research. Everyone talk about that. Um, however, the answer is overwhelmingly positive. Every interviewee hold very positive attitudes towards this difference, which means they embrace the culture difference here. They like, they love the Canadian culture, the low power distance. For example, this is a quote from an interviewee. She said, we have distinct and rigid hierarchies in the Chinese society. I tended to be obedient to my supervisors. But here, the relationship is more equal. For example, in the Chinese university, when taking pictures in some events, leaders sit in the front center, and students stand at the back. Here, it is in the opposite way. One, uh, once the Minister of Defense of Canada visited the Canadian university they are studying, and I attended that conference, he invited us to stand in the center, and he stood aside with us. I didn't know he was the Minister of Defense until I saw the news. I couldn't believe the Minister of Defense stood right beside me. They were so happy. They feel being respected. So, so they all love this low, her low hierarchy, the low power distance in Canada. So what about the second um, dimension? Individualism versus collectivism, mainly positive. Uh, for example, uh, the Canadian culture, uh, in terms of encouraging individual differences, uh, having flexible and wider career options, better work-life balance, emphasis on performance rather than relations. These are all welcomed by those students. The last one uh, is somewhat mixed. Uh, it's the emphasis on assertiveness and confidence. So confidence plays a key role in uh, job-seeking experience and also in your workplace, workplace behavior or performance. Uh, actually, those students were, were all very confident. However, something hinders their confidence or their competitiveness. One reason is about the Chinese traditional modest culture. We were, we, were, we were taught to be very modest, not to brag, not to um, uh, actively sell, sell yourself. So this self-selling skill were not, not very well trained in the, in the Chinese education, but here it's very important. Um, so let's look at uh, another quote. So this person says, I might have been too modest, even if I have absolute confidence of success, I would merely say, I think I could do it. <laughs> Canadian people are more adventurous, so they may seize more opportunities than we could. It was very difficult to make your strengths known by others. 
the first impression was always made through language. If in the first week I failed to chat with my colleagues with dancing eyebrows, uh, eyebrows and a uh, reading, <laughs> reading face, they might think I was introvert, shy, incapable, or unconfident, but it was not the case. I love to chat with you, but English is not my mother tongue. So here you can see the major problem is actually about language. It's language that hinders their confidence, that diminishes their confidence. Anyway, uh, about individualism and collectivism, the reaction was uh, still uh, overwhelmingly positive. It's not a big, big problem. And about the last one, nonverbal behaviors, low versus high context. Uh, the Canadians are, are considered as being more frank and less is evasive uh, by, by Chinese people. And this is so good. People enjoy this communication style. For example, here, this is a quote. I was rejuvenated. I became younger. I became more simple-minded, less strategic, more honest. I can express my views frankly with less misgivings because there are less social constraints here than in China. They love it. It's never a problem at all. OK, so you see. The traditional, uh, the, the prevailing academic notion of subjective cultural differences is never a problem for the Chinese uh, students or young professionals in their adaptation in the Canadian workplace. So, what is the major cultural challenges? It's the objective culture. Let's look at what the students think are the major challenges. Okay, what? language barriers. It's more than you think. It's more, it's more difficult than perhaps uh, immigrants or students from any other country because Chinese language and English language is so different. And Chinese is not a traditionally colonized country. You know, many other uh, countries have been colonized and English is their official language. But China, no. And Chinese language is so different from English language. So this is incredibly difficult. Many a time, you cannot even find the meanings of the slangs or acronyms in any dictionaries. Because the only thing we can rely on when, when we were taught English in, in China is the dictionary. And here, also, we, we used to look, look up dictionaries whenever we don't understand. And we cannot find it in any dictionary. The only way is to Google them. And there's no, no Google in China. So, <laughs> you can, so when, when, when now I'm teaching some students in China uh, through online teaching, and they, they cannot make, make use of Google. Exactly. Oh. No one has ever taught us those slums throughout our English language education in China. That's true. That's true. I swear, I, I've been always the top student uh, in, in Chinese education system. I led all kinds of examinations, especially English examinations, but still, still I feel so difficult when I came to Canada, beginning to interact with people in, the, in real life. I, I encounter these things every day. My son is in grade six now. Uh, he came to Canada uh, at the age of five. His English, his vocabulary, his understanding of the nuances between different words, so much better than me. Yeah. <laughs> Second thing, jokes. Canadian people enjoy telling jokes. It's your, it's, it's your everyday life. When they are joking, you can rarely understand it. And even if you do, you don't think it's funny at all. I think because of some hidden meanings of the same word that only native speakers will understand. Yeah, it may be because of some sitcoms you have watched <laughs> decades, decades ago. <laughs> yeah. And we never knew that. Yeah. Yes. And this can be a problem. Yeah, I'll talk about more. I, I'll talk, talk about it later. Another problem, also related to language barriers, that is the self selling I've mentioned self selling skills, networking skills, social skills. I remember someone. Um, a CEO, uh, she once gave a speech to the Chinese students. Uh, she said, oh, please, uh, Chinese students, please 
don't just focus on your academic score, your GPA. Please do more social uh, networking. <laughs> Please be more uh, out, outgoing. Uh, be, uh, be more uh, proactive. Take initiative to speak with people. However, she, she, she didn't understand the difficulty here. Chinese are usually reluctant to reach out to people due to the limit of language ability. You may look somewhat awkward or even silly if your English is not good enough. If you cannot integrate well into the normal environment in the workplace, you are no more than a working machine, no matter how excellent you are doing. You may become a senior, but you will stay in that position forever. You are the most experienced senior, but you will never become a manager. So this could partly explain why we see uh, so few Chinese in the uh, senior administration. Yeah, they remain a senior employee, a most experienced, excellent worker, no other than a working machine. That's it. So they never made, make it to the top management, only because language, language barriers. Oh, okay, this is about language barrier. And what's more, it's another part of the objective culture. That is the, uh, we call it local knowledge, but it's all more about sports pop culture, uh, etc. Mm. See, so Chinese students are generally lack of local knowledge. For example, sports. They say, yeah. what they talk about are always hockey, <laughs> rugby, baseball, or golf, etc. I have no idea and no interest at all. I don't even know the rules of those sports games. I can tell you more about it. About it. If you were raised up in China, you never had a chance to play these things. Yeah. Or all you are asked to do is to read, to read and write homework, right? Read your, your textbook, uh, English, uh, literature, and ma mathematics, maybe physics and chemistry. That's all. That's how you spend your whole uh, education, your whole education in China. Here in Canada, my son, he has, he has uh, piano class, violin class, uh, flute, and he has uh, uh, skating, uh, um, skiing, and swimming, uh, um, the karate, and uh, tennis, um, what else? Yeah, everything else. So it's so different. So the child, the education here, emphasizing on the recreational part, like the sports and arts so much. Chinese students just don't have this privilege. So they have no common talk, they know nothing about this, including me. Uh, yeah, I know nothing about that. Another part, the TV programs. This is a quote. I don't have many Canadian friends because we don't have common topics. A big topic other than sports among local people was the television variety shows like sitcoms or something. I never watched those programs, and neither did I want to. Mm -hmm. I would enjoy watching Chinese, Chinese variety shows and TV dramas rather than North American ones. Mm. So uh, I wanted to warn, warn, you, warn you that, uh, that the course following this could be somewhat offensive uh, because these students had very good relationship with me, and they they dare to tell their true feelings mm -hmm. to me, to share their true feelings. Uh, many could be negative, so please be prepared. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Don't be offended. Um, all right. Um, oh, movies. Okay, not so, so offensive. Yeah. It may be better if they talk about something like movies, but even if you have watched the same movies, you don't know the English names of the stars. Okay, clubs, bars, parties, and drinks. I actually still feel it's difficult to integrate into Western culture. They enjoy going clubs after work. They like drinking in bars, but we don't. At lunchtime, I felt it was difficult to chime in their conversations. So it's, uh, also, it's, it also hinders their networking skills. Uh, I once moved to live with a local friend with the intention to integrate into their life, but it turned out to be a culture because he held parties every Thursday night. So this is not a, a recreation, recreation style that the Chinese students enjoy. 
Um, okay, Western history and literature. I had nothing to chat with them. I knew nothing about history and culture here. I did take an undergraduate course of history of Western Revolution for two semesters, covering uh, Renaissance, French Revolution, etc. It actually took me even more time than my accounting process took. But now I almost forgot them all. Maybe it did have some influence on me, but I felt myself still a Chinese completely. Social infrastru infrastructure. You don't even know how to get off the bus. That is when they first came. If you get on, got, get on it for the first time, no one instructs you to pull the rope inside the bus. You have to learn it by observing what other passengers do. We can't even identify where the bus stop is. <laughs> Can you imagine it? And because of language barrier, you don't even have the courage to ask for help. You can't complain to anybody because people cannot help you if you can't make yourself clear. So imagine how much, how much difficulty they have experienced when they first came to Canada. Okay, next. I want to ask, uh, so if you are Chinese, please remain silent. Uh, so how many of you know this guy? Okay, excellent. We have one gentleman knowing. So who is he? The monkey king. The monkey king. Yeah, he's pro probably the most famous uh, figure in the Chinese literature uh, to the Western air world. Yeah. Okay. Next question for you. <laughs> Who are they? Oh. <laughs> Anyone knows? Except Chinese. <laughs> no. Okay. So this is another famous. Um, couple, <laughs> lovers, uh, another famous figures in the Chinese traditional uh, literature, classics. Dream of the Red Chamber. Exactly. Bingo. Wow. Oh, <laughs> the variable. <laughs> what are they? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Chinese, I know, all Chinese know them, but I want to ask Western, Western English speakers. Yeah. So this is uh, another very famous uh, uh, figure, yeah, in, uh, in 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 modern Chinese literature, uh, in the we call it wuxia uh, which means uh, uh, which means sword, translated as swordsman, swordsman literature, swordsman fiction, yeah. I know she. Yeah, everyone knows her. It's a it's pop culture. It's the uh, one of the most uh, popular TV drama in China in recent years. Another most popular. So we are so familiar with them, but not you. So I show them. I just want to show that uh, we Chinese people are ignorant of Western pop culture, and Westerners are equally ignorant of Chinese pop culture. So this is another problem, another challenge for the uh, Chinese young professionals. Quote, I find our only common topic with them is Chinese food. <laughs> or some fancy cities like Shanghai and Beijing in China. They are not informed of China, and we are not informed of Canada. If, if talking about celebrities, they don't know the ones we are talking about. Like them, they, these are celebrities. And we don't know theirs. So we cannot find common topics. This can be a problem. How do we socialize? How do we network? What would what do we talk about in lunch time? Um, okay, and what's worse? Local people are perceived to be unaware of their Chinese co-workers' needs. When they speak slangs that I cannot follow, I think it's because they assume me as coming from the same culture with them. When they are telling a joke, I would laugh with them, even though I don't catch the meaning. <laughs> I usually have a deep sense of alienation under that circumstances. I usually try to attend all the company work <coughs> events, for instance, trivia night, where they would give various bizarre questions and have to answer them. If the company is dominated by local people, there will be large amounts of questions from Canadian cultural background, which you have no idea at all. It can be a problem for team building because there were prizes. They, but they are simply not aware of that problem. Um, I remember once we went out for a team lunch. The three local guys kept talking about sports, and I could do nothing but kept eating. 
together with another Chinese team member. It was embarrassing. I cannot help but keep silent. The culture gap is there. I think this could be offensive. I think in their culture, there's no such thing as taking care of everybody else. So this is a perceived um, unaware, local people's unawareness of Chinese people's needs. Okay, so all these things, they could cause potentially very negative emo emotional reactions, such as confusion, nervousness, misgivings, embarrassment, extreme frustration, and profound alienation. For example, a quote, I don't have many Canadian friends because we don't have common topics. We Chinese tell different jokes. I can't get Westerners jokes. I only have professional relationships with them. At the dinner table, since I can't understand their jokes, I'll speak only with my Chinese peers. It is like smashing the pot because it's cracked. Push, right? In Chinese. So it means acting recklessly out of feeling of hopelessness. So uh, even though they know it's important to be uh, outgoing, to uh, be more proactive, networking is important, you should talk, up, talk with them about anything they are interested, they just cannot. So this could be quite um, a problem. Um, however, these nine students still remain positive. They, they have a, quite a mental resilience here. One of the uh, interviewees says, humor plays an important role in their culture. I know we can't get their points when they are joking. We cannot do anything about it. But if you try to tell one or two jokes, though they cannot get them either, they will at least understand that you are trying to tell a joke. And it will live up atmosphere. This is important in daily interactions with people. And another young guy, um, he is actually, he's now the, uh, he's now the manager of the uh, uh, Spring Garden branch of Bimo Bank. He, uh, have you noticed uh, a Chinese, ch the Chinese sign of Bimo in the Spring Garden Road? Yeah. Yes, that's, a, that's because of a proposal by this young guy. Wow. Uh, so the Halifax, uh, Spring Garden branch of BMO is the third uh, BMO branch that has the Chinese sign uh, across Canada. No, that's all because of this nice. young, young man's suggestion. So he made it and he was quite encouraged. Uh, he said, I, at that time, it was uh, four or five years ago, he was, he was only an employee, he's not the bank manager yet. He's, uh, he said, this made me feel that also, we are not the dominant community in this city. As long as every Chinese keep putting effort to make Westerners aware of our cultural existence, we may have more and more influence on this city. I don't want to admit that they discriminate against Chinese graduates. There might be glass ceilings, but I don't want it to affect my ambition to exert effort on my career. Language and culture barriers may impede my career growth, but I believe I can change it through effort. And I think once there is one person who makes it, there will be more and more people trying to make it. Yes, so this is impressive. Uh, I think I am encouraged by him, uh, and I finally made it to the mount. Uh, this is not easy. Um, okay, so here is a a uh, time for discussion. Uh, I have uh, a number of questions I'd like to discuss with you. And you are welcome to, uh, to express <coughs> your comments, your feelings, any ideas, suggestions, please. So first, I want to talk about uh, why is it objective? Why, uh, why is it, what's the major challenges? Objective culture, culture gap rather than subjective culture. Um, I think a major reason is all the interviewees, they, they are determined to stay in Canada, which means they quite identify with Canadian values. So those who do not may have already returned to China, or they, they don't really want to stay in Canada. Uh, so uh, 
uh, and, and for immigrants, for Chinese immigrants like me, we are of course identified with with Canadian value, or not all of us, but I would say the major the majority of us, because for me actually. The biggest reason I left China is because I want to look for a society that tolerates diverse voices. So diversity, inclusion, and equality are the values I identify with so strongly that I left China. I gave up everything. I gave up all the achievements I made in China. So how can Canadian values be a counter challenge for us? So it's never a challenge. But why objective culture gap becomes so difficult? I think it's because what you read, what you read, uh, what you watch during your childhood, uh, your education, your socialization, your life experience during your childhood and youth essentially defines your cultural identity. So our cultural identity is essentially defined by Chinese education, Chinese culture, Chinese um, life experience. And time is insurmountable. Time is insurmountable. It's, it's almost impossible for me to, to reach, the, uh, reach the, uh, the, um, the understanding level uh, the same as my, my son. Uh, who is only 11 years old, what he knew about Canadian culture way more than, than I do. And it's, it's, I, I, can, I just cannot make up, make up for it. Time is insurmountable. So this is why culture, objective culture gap becomes so difficult for us. Um, what's the implications? Yeah, I invite your thoughts on this. So my suggestion is for Canadian people become more aware of the cultural existence and the needs of your Chinese peers, of the Chinese community. Um, I can't require you to stop telling jokes or <laughs> stop saying colloquialism because you don't even know you are speaking colloquialism when you are speaking them. You don't. You never realize you were you were using some slangs and because you just to speak it. That's your language. How can we stop you doing that? We 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 don't have that right. But please be a little more aware of the difficulty, of the struggles we are we have, and be a little more patient with us. Uh, maybe uh, spend a little more time explaining some slangs or colloquialism with your Chinese friends. That would be much appreciated. And another suggestion, more courses and trainings. That is for the uh, education uh, institutions, like the, uh, uh, the universities, maybe also middle, middle schools, high schools. Why not having more, um, it, it's two-way. It's two like for the Chinese students, I think they need more courses on Canadian culture, the Canadian pop arts. Uh, Canadian dramas, literature, uh, history, uh, etc. And for the uh, Canadian students, uh, can we have more courses on Chinese culture uh, so that we become mutually interested in each other? We could find some common topics, right? This could be very helpful. Objective culture, also the gap is huge, but we can do a little by little, more and more, to, to amend this, this gap, perhaps. Yeah, that's my suggestions. And I'd like to, to know your ideas. Um, and next, I have a few minutes left. I want to talk about my experience. So what about your later experience? Uh, for me, uh, I'm in my middle age. Uh, I'm 42 years old. And uh, so I have been working in uh, at the Mount for almost three years. And uh, the objective culture, it's still a challenge. It remains the biggest challenge. Yeah, of course. However, uh, as, I, um, as I work longer or uh, integrate uh, deeper into the 
into my workplace, another problem emerged. And guess what? It is about the subjective culture again. Subjective culture. Uh, let's, uh, if you recall, what are the major culture, uh, subjective cultural values difference um, we have? Yeah. So one of the biggest uh, subjective culture difference is low versus high power distance. And I found it begin to be more to be more challenging than I thought. So why? The reason is, so uh, I'm working now at the Mount, not only a, yeah, I'm a young, I'm an assistant professor. I'm relatively junior. However, I'm already invited to sit in various committees. And these committees are, uh, are more or less related to uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Yeah, um, one of the committee I joined is the faculty associations, um, um, it's called Equity Action Committee. Uh, it's to examine the, ine the inequalities or inequalities exist in the Mount community. Yeah, and to, to take actions to change it. So um, I'm honored to be invited to join the committee. But what I what I observed is that my my colleagues, they are mostly Canadian people. They are so proactive and they participate in the decision making. Uh, they they uh, don't dare criticizing the policies. They don't care, they don't dare criticizing uh, the senior administration of the month. Yeah, which is considered impossible in China. You know, when I was working in the, in the Chinese university, I was literally silenced. Uh, because of the hierarchy, because of the power distance, you didn't have any, you don't have any opportunity to participate in decision making. You don't have the, the information needed. Here, we have plenty of information uh, sh being shared to us, and we were expected to participate in decision making. But in China, we never had this training. We never had this experience. and we. And when I came to Canada, I don't know the bottom line. So to what extent I could speak? Um, my, my colleagues keep, kept amazed at me uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the extent to which they can critique the, 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 uh, the administration or the dominant, uh, the dominant groups. So in China, this is totally impossible. So we were silenced. Uh, opp and oppressed in China because of the, you know, the censorship, the hierarchy, the power distance, and the, the patriarchy, the traditional patriarchy system. As a female um, young professional, I've, I, I understood it. But here in Canada, we, we were also marginalized and silenced by the language barrier, by the culture, the objective culture gap. So, um, so we really we never enjoy the privilege of freedom of expression, and now we are encouraged to to do so, to uh, exercise your right. But how? Yeah, it's so difficult. We don't have experience. I'm learning. I'm learning by practicing. Yeah, I really feel I I have a lot to learn, uh, and. Yeah, this is something I would say a subjective culture gap. Uh, this is a, a challenge posed by the subjective culture gap. In the initial, in the early uh, stage, it, it's never a problem. But as you integrate into the workplace more and more, you begin to feel it. It became a problem. Yeah, I'm learning, I'm working on it. I really want to be empowered. I want to. Uh, take advantage of the Canadian uh, social structure. This supportive institution, uh, this, this, yeah, this supportive social arrangement where one can speak what you think and what you want, but how? We need to learn. We really need to learn. And uh, I, I also uh, would like Canadian people 
being more patient with us, giving us more support, understanding our struggle, and uh, providing us more platform to speak, to have our, our voice heard, like this one. Yeah. Um, so this is my reflection. Uh, and a last, a last question. Last reflection is about, yeah, what about Canadian people? What about Canadians in China? So consider if you go to China, what do you think will be the largest cultural challenge for you? Do you think it will be a subjective culture gap or objective culture gap? Both? Yeah, both. Language? Okay, I'll let you know. Language will never become a problem. At least it's not a major problem. Let me finish my sentence. I'll, uh, because most, if not all, Canadian people, when they are working in China, they are encouraged or they are valued by their English speaking ability. Yeah, they work there. M many of them, they, the reason they could work in China is because they speak English. So they could use English without any, without any difficulty in China. Language is never a problem, but a privilege enjoyed by English speakers. So it's the opposite way. And for the subjective culture, wow, it could be difficult. For example, the communication style. Remember, Chinese, students, Chinese people, this high context uh, communication style, you have to relate what he says with the context of his speech. Yeah, and also the power distance, the hierarchy, you may not be able to share, to, to um, get access to the information you need. So you may not be granted the opportunity to speak, to, to participate in the uh, decision making process, uh, whatever organization you are working for. So this could be very uncomfortable, and it's also very insurmountable. Yeah. Well, this is uh, only my uh, um, speculation. We are stuck in something <coughs> like something in between. Uh, I, I resonate yeah. with Maria's yeah. comment. We stuck in as uh, something in between. Um, but in the end, I consider myself as a hybrid, uh, yeah. and I cherish my hybridity. Yeah. Yeah. As and now, I'm not completely a Chinese. I'm already part, part of me is already Canadian. Uh, I'm a Canadian now. And culturally, I'm also part of Canadian. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a hybrid. And I'm, I'm proud of it. And I am myself. I don't have to be a Chinese or a Canadian. Yeah, I just want to develop me, myself. Yeah. Canada has an identity. We've suffered with our identity ever since inception. So this in between feeling that you're having, that is. <laughs> that is what Canada needs. <laughs> 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 yes. This is this is diversity so and inclusion. This is why I I love Canada. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you.